Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. In today's diary, Jan is updating some work that he did three years ago. Three years ago, Jan reported about a slight decrease in the number of industrial control systems that were exposed to the internet. Now, measuring that number isn't easy, and uh, Jan is going through some details here in how he compared and analyzed and weighted different measurements here. In particular, Jan looked at the differences between Census, Shadow Server, and Shodan, who are three well-intended and very qualified organizations who are collecting the data, but of course they all have their own methodology in how they collect the data and what they collect the data for. And that explains some of the differences between Shadow Server on the low end with 60,000 devices and well, Census and Shodan being somewhat close around 100,000 devices, but only after Jan removed some of the devices from Census because, well, uh, Census has a slightly different definition of what they consider an ICS device. Well, long story short, uh, the number of ICS devices is increasing. It's increasing by about 30,000 devices over the last three years since Jan wrote up this initial sort of noted decrease in devices. What's also interesting is that uh, the increase and decrease is actually dependent on the country you're looking at. So there appears to be some effect of national policy and also just the attention being spent in different countries on securing these devices better. And currently, Black Hat Asia is going on, and a talk by Shmuel Cohen from SafeBridge has caught some attention regarding turning an XDR into a malicious tool. The goal here is essentially using the XDR for privilege escalation. The XDR is running at elevated privileges. If you convince it to execute your payload, then of course you inherit the privileges that the XDR has been given. In addition, of course, you could also turn the XDR off or blind to a particular threat. We had, of course, similar issues with uh, various security tools in the past uh, where they could be leveraged uh, for privilege escalation. Now, just to make it clear, this is not just uh, breaking into the admin interface and launching commands that way. Uh, That, of course, is an obvious threat, but instead it's about uh, manipulating and compromising the protected endpoint without necessarily interfering with the central admin console. The weakness that Shmuel uh, came up with here is that the signatures were actually not all that well protected. They were digitally signed, so it wasn't easy to replace an individual signature. However, it was possible via a hard link to point the XDR software to a different directory and that way execute uh, rules that were not protected by these digital signatures. This was demonstrated with uh, Palo Alto's Cortex uh, product and that was of the subject of uh, Shmuel's uh, research here. However, it's assumed that similar tricks may be possible with other XDRs and this really just sort of a proof of concept, I would call it, to show that you have to make sure that your XDR doesn't get compromised by an attacker. And of course, a lot of that is up to the vendor to implement sufficient protections. The same researcher did also point out some issues with, uh, for example, Microsoft Defender. And in that case, it was just possible by injecting uh, signatures to, for example, cause it to delete various files, which at the very least, of course, can lead to a denial of service. But there have been cases where the ability to delete files could actually be used for privilege escalation or authentication bypass. And yesterday I mentioned the bug in GitHub that allowed an attacker to leave a comment with a malicious attachment that becomes sort of undeletable 
if the comment is deleted, but still downloadable by unsuspecting victims. Well, it turns out that GitLab has pretty much the same vulnerability. The mechanism is pretty much identical to a GitHub. The only difference here is that GitLab requires a login in order to upload or download the file. So it's not just a simple click on the link. But again, remember the trick here is that this link leads to a trusted URL, a Git repository that you trust. So you logging in is probably not that difficult to overcome as far as barriers are concerned if you already trusting this particular repository. Well, and this is it for today. Remember, I'll be teaching the Defending Web Applications class in a few weeks in San Diego uh, later this year in Washington, D.C. There are a couple other events coming up. I'll link in the show notes to a quick sort of demo section that uh, Jason Lamb recorded. So thanks and talk to you again tomorrow.